Okay, so hi everybody, um, and thanks to Jeff uh, for having me join you for this session. So uh, we're going to be talking about VI Analyzer, and this kind of this presentation's got a tagline of the unsung hero of software quality. Um, a little footnote: there might be a tiny little bit of test standing here as well at the end if we get time. Um, I have so that that title might be familiar. I have I did originally give this presentation, I guess before COVID, whenever that was, was that like 2019 or something? Um, but it has, it has changed quite a bit since then. Uh, this is definitely uh, updated. So uh, even if you've caught some of this before, um, stay tuned. I think there's quite a bit of new content in here that you might find interesting. So my name is Chris Roebuck. Uh, I'm a software architect and director at Conrad Technologies based out of the UK. I'm a certified LabVIEW architect uh, test stand architect and love you champion and also occasionally teach some of the ni courses um by trade i'm a physicist and actually it was whilst i was doing my uh, taking my physics undergraduate degree that i actually discovered love you so that way that was way back in uh, 1996 um whilst i was doing my degree um, one of my college professors handed me a box of Bolin C++, I think it's Bolin C++ 4.5, 4 and a box of LabVIEW for Windows 3.1, and said, make one of these do something. So I took the Bolin C++ and spent two weeks, and at the end of two weeks, I'd created a dialog box and put several large dents in my desk, um, at which point I picked up LabVIEW and never looked back. So definitely been a LabVIEW and test stand cheerleader since that point. And uh, that's attested by the fact that I've had some really cool birthday cakes in the past. I take my kids to NI Week for their vacation and uh, I'm a member of the Jeff K Appreciation Society. Just a little bit about Conrad uh, before we dive in. Um, as I mentioned, I'm at Conrad in the UK. Um, and we've been steadily growing a really awesome team. Um, when I joined, there were four of us, um, I guess, four and a half years ago now. Uh, we're now up to 12. We've got a couple of uh, LabVIEW champions. So there's myself and there's Richard Thomas on the far left of the screen. We've got five uh, certified LabVIEW architects now in the team. And uh, I've started working with some of the local universities to take on uh, undergraduate degree students who come with us and work and spend a year working with us, seeing what we do, and hopefully decide to pursue a career in engineering and test automation specifically uh, at the end of that. So uh, just a little, a little plug for Conrad UK. And another engagement, I'm also involved in GDEVCON, where I'm a member of the board. GDEVCON is an independent conference uh, focusing primarily on graphical programming, so highly relevant to what we all do uh, nine to five. Um, if you'd like to find out more about GDEVCON, uh, please hit me up or even Jeff. Uh, Jeff is involved in GDEVCON NA, GDEVCON North America, which will be having an event later this year. And we have our European event in Scotland in September. So if you'd like to know more about those two events, uh, reach out to myself or Jeff later on today. Okay, so let's dive in, um, but let's just recap a little bit first. Today, we're gonna be talking about using VI Analyzer uh, to improve software quality. So what, what is software quality? Well, it can be broken down into two areas, really. Functional quality, how well software complies with or conforms to a given design based on some functional requirements or specifications. So we hopefully have a requirement. I know that's not always the case, but we hopefully have a requirement that describes how a piece of software should function, the tasks that it should perform, and quality software should comply with that requirement. We've also got structural quality, how well software complies with non-functional requirements, such as maintainability scalability and robustness. Yep. So having a piece of software that um, it works well, but is totally unmaintainable, that nobody else can support, or uh, that crashes every 30 minutes, 
uh, indicates poor quality. So these are two areas that we uh, we're going to be looking at uh, throughout this presentation. Effectively, with those two areas, we're asking the question, is the software fit for purpose? Yeah, and we're going to try and improve that software quality to ensure that we can answer that question with a yes. But of course, software does have bugs. Uh, if I take the Wikipedia definition, a software bug is an error, flaw, failure or fault in a computer program or system that causes it to behave in incorrect ways or produce incorrect or unexpected results. Um, because software in general, I know we've now got chat GPT uh, fixing all of our problems, but software in general is created by humans. And because of that, it's prone to things such as syntax errors. We've miswired something or we've mistyped something if we're stuck using a text-based programming language. Perhaps as the developer, we've actually misunderstood those requirements. We've got a document that says what's required, but it's still down to our interpretation, our communication with that written document, and perhaps confirmation with the writer of that document, but it's open to interpretation and misunderstanding is possible. There's also environmental variables. Uh, perhaps we've written a piece of software to work with one operating system or with one piece of equipment. And at some point in time, something has changed in the environment in which our software is being used. So, for example, they've tried it's been tried to be ported to a different operating system or indeed maybe the operating system has just been upgraded. We've moved from Windows 8 to Windows 10, for example, or from a 32 bit operating system to a 64 bit operating system with a slightly different file structure. So there are variables in the environment in which the software operates that can affect its reliability and can manifest itself as a bug. And then, of course, there are tool chain errors. Now we use LabVIEW, right? So there are there are no tool chain errors. But but seriously, you know, the, the tools that we use to develop our software themselves are pieces of software. And the same rules apply, of course. So they can likewise be subject to bugs. So I always I have I've I've talked about this book so many times over the last 10 years. Um but I single-handedly put it down as one of the most impactful books that I've written that's had an effect on myself as a developer in terms of the quality of the work that I do, but also my understanding of the responsibilities that uh, fall upon a software developer uh, when, when writing code, when creating products or tools. Uh, it's written by a guy called Joel Spolsky. Joel is creator of Stack Overflow, uh, the Fogs, Fog Bugs issue tracking software, and also Trello, the task planning software. He has a blog, joelonsoftware.com, but it's also been published. You can grab this from, um, from Amazon or wherever. It's a very, very good book. And within this book, Joel talks about the five steps to improve software quality. And he asks the question, which of these are you doing? And if you're not doing all of them, then effectively you're missing a trick when it comes to the quality of your software. So the question he asks firstly is, do you have a spec? Do you have a specification for the piece of software that is being created, either a functional specification, requirement specification that describes what the software should do? If you don't have that and you're just writing, you know, you're being a gunslinger, shooting from the hip, just writing that code because you understand what the customer probably wants, then you're missing an opportunity to produce quality software. He also asks, do you have testers and or unit tests? Are the functional blocks within your code being tested and having various inputs uh, thrown at them to ensure that they work under all circumstances? Do you hold code reviews? Is somebody else looking at the syntax, looking at our block diagrams, uh, reviewing what's being written uh, with, a, with one eye on the specification to understand its appropriateness? Do you have a build system 
or continuous integration system. So when developers are making changes, are you automatically building the software um, artifacts, whether it be an executable, whether it be a packed project library, whatever it might be, is that build happening automatically? Is it being is that build being tested? Are you running your unit tests on the code as it's being built? So creating a very tightly coupled uh, uh, workflow between making a code change, testing the code and producing whatever the output of that code is, be it a library or an executable. Do you also perform usability testing? Does somebody use your user interface um, who's perhaps not familiar with it um, and uh, test out the accessibility of that interface, for example? So we ask these questions. The ones, the question that we're really going to be focusing on today is: Do you hold? Do you have code reviews? Uh, but also, we'll touch upon the build system and the CI aspects. Now, I don't know about you. But I love code reviews, not the thought of having somebody sat next to me looking at my code. You know, I, as developers, I think we're all we, we, we take the, the, the code that we generate. We take criticism of it very personally. I, I'm going to put my hand up and say I absolutely do. If somebody looks at my code and criticizes it, I do take it personally. And I know that it, that's not their intention. But it, 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 I find it a, a difficult, um, a difficult situation. So I, I don't um, particularly enjoy them. But code reviews are important, and it, it's more about the point in the development process when code reviews are taking place that makes them important, rather than specifically the fact that my work colleague Matt, Richard, Robin, whoever it is is looking at, at my software, what's important is that they're looking at the software, but when in the development process they're looking at my software. So this is taken, there's a, a link down at the bottom, uh, stickyminds.com, really good article on a shift left approach to software testing. So effectively testing software much, much earlier in the development process. I advise you, you take a look at that link, there's a really good white paper there. But it's got some really stark, and actually I was, I was quite shocked by it, um, but it, it kind of makes sense if we take a step back and think about it. 85% of errors are introduced during the development phase, right? I mean, I'm, honestly, it's, it's probably more, uh, but at least 85% of errors are introduced during the development phase. Four times the number of our errors are identified during the testing phase versus the development phase. So as a developer start writing code, we simply don't catch the errors that we as the developer have introduced. It's the old expression of you can't see the wood for the trees. We are not catching the errors as we are writing the code. And the impact of that is that there is a tenfold increase in the cost of fix fixing, fixing errors during system test. The scary thing is that this rises to all over 640 times the increasing cost of fixing errors post release. So the impact, the cost in time and therefore money of fixing errors rises almost exponentially the further through the development process that we get. But most of the errors are introduced at the front end of that. So the earlier that we can introduce testing, such as code reviews, the lower the cost of the project, uh, the lower the cost of the project. So we've got an argument for shifting left as, as much as we possibly can. So maybe we don't need my colleague Matt or Richard sat next to me. If we could have automated code reviews, then I won't take it quite so personally and get really upset that. Richard's criticizing uh, the way that I wire my error clusters. He will comment that it looks like the, the ridges on the top of a castle or crenellation, whatever that's called. Uh, so perhaps automated code reviews can help us. That also allows us to do testing, allows us to do code reviews more frequently. And as we've just seen from those statistics, the more testing we can do earlier, the more likely we are to catch errors and reduce the cost of our of our project. So automated code reviews. Well, 
in other languages, the expression code linting is quite popular. A linter is a tool that analyzes source code to flag for errors, be it syntax errors, stylistic errors, and something I'm going to talk about a little later, which I would refer to as dangerous constructs. In terms of commercial tools out there, um, some of you who've done C++ or JavaScript may have heard of things such as PC Lint, ReSharper for C Sharps, an extremely popular tool, and JS Hint. They're both, all, all three are linting tools. But we've also got a couple of other tools, such as VI Analyzer and Sequence Analyzer, other tools that we are using. All of these tools integrate to some degree into the development environments that we're using. In terms of VI Analyzer, for LabVIEW, VI Analyzer performs static code analysis which means it's analyzing non-running or idle code. And the analysis that it's performing, it's able to inspect the properties of a VI, um, the settings of a VI, um, the naming of the VI, for example, the VI's block diagram, and the front panel of a VI. So VI analyzer analyzes those three, or can analyze those three areas. And by doing this analysis, it en enables us to identify three areas, performance issues, dangerous constructs, and style issues. So this slide is taken, actually, I think this is from one of our um, um, one of our attendees, uh, Darren, uh, Darren Nattinger from NI, um, creator of um, many, many wonderful LabVIEW-based tools such as QuickDrop, uh, big shout out to QuickDrop, and VI Analyzer, and is extremely uh, prolific on the VI Analyzer enthusiast community page. Um, and there's a presentation there, which I believe has been recently updated. Um, in NI resplendent in NI green color, uh, but it, it, there's a presentation there from Darren about improving code quality through aut automated code analysis. And it shows this particular slide here, which is accessing VI Analyzer. But VI Analyzer is accessed through the LabVIEW environment by going to the tools menu, selecting VI Analyzer, and then analyze VIs. We're then presented with a number of options whereby we can start a new or define a new analysis task, load an existing task. So maybe we've already run VI Analyzer and selected what we want to analyze um, and how to analyze it. But we can also define a new task from scratch, perform the analysis, get the results, and also provide an optional report uh, if we have, for example, a quality department or an audit trail uh, to comply with. So we're going to get started with it, though. Let's dive in and actually use it. So for a couple of these, I've gone with videos rather than demos. But here I've got two, I've got a LabVIEW project and I've got two VIs. Um, you can see by their names, I've got a VI that has some block diagram issues, things that aren't quite right with its block diagram. And we'll talk about what those things might be a little bit later. But it's got some problems with its block diagram. I've also got another VI that has some front panel issues, things that aren't correct about its front panel. And we're going to use VI Analyzer to analyze those and indicate what those problems are. So we go to the tools menu, VI Analyzer, Analyze VIs. The VI Analyzer tool then launches, and in this case, we're going to start a new analysis task. Now we can select to analyze the active project, or we can add items to our VI Analyzer task. In this case, we're going to select the directory that contains the code, that we want to analyze these two VIs. And we can see here, uh, VI Analyzer has indicated the two VIs that it's found. 
We're now going to be presented with the opportunity to select what analysis we wish to perform on those two BIs. And you can see there, it's been broke, broken down into six areas. Block diagram, complexity metric, metrics, documentation, front panel, general and VI metrics. <coughs> Obviously, most of those names are self-explanatory. The, the block diagram items, we're going to be looking at the diagram, the objects, the wires, that are on the block diagram and checking them for certain uh, checking the block diagram for compliance against certain rules same thing with the front panel complexity matrix metrics we're going to be looking at things like the number of nested structures on our block diagram and how complex a block a given block diagram is mm -hmm. documentation we're going to be looking for documentation we're going to be looking for uh how does our uh, vi have a description uh, is describing what that VI does as an example. So to resume this video, we're going to actually go ahead and deselect because there's a lot of tests that VI analyzer ships with. I'm sure Darren can paste in the chat the number of tests that now ship with LabVIEW, but it, it's a significant number. In the interests of time for this video, I'm going to deselect them and I'm going to select the tests that I know my two example VIs have problems with. My block diagram issues are that I've wired under objects, so I'm going to test for that. And my front panel issues are that I have a non-transparent label on a front panel control. Uh, both things, well, certainly the transparent labels are pet hits of mine, and you often see this with non-transparent labels, and they typically are in the most horrendous colors as well. So we're going to analyze those two VIs. And we're going to analyze them for block diagram style, i.e. wires under, lab, under objects. And we're going to analyze it for front panel uh, style, non-transparent labels. So we've selected the tests that we want to perform. And we're going to save, or maybe not save our analysis, because you're going to hit the analyze button. And we've performed our analysis and obviously it was fast because of the number of tests that were being performed were quite minimal and we can see there that vi analyzer oh, vi analyzer has indicated that we've got a couple of failures vi with block diagram issues has failed because of the wire under objects rule not being complied with and vi with front panel issues has failed because of non-transparent labels now I don't know if you saw that quickly, but if we click on the failure in the VI Analyzer results window, VI Analyzer takes us to that occurrence for that particular failure. So there we can see the VI does indeed have a wire running behind an object. And if we click on the other one, we can see that we've got some terribly non-transparent labels on the front panel. And I think that's about it. So, as I mentioned, there are three, three things in LabVIEW that primarily impact quality. Stylistic issues, performance issues, and dangerous constructs. So we're going to have a look at those um, in order. So stylistic issues, and I know Darren's going to kill me for this next slide. I know we all hate this picture, and it does a terrible disservice to LabVIEW. Um, but it's not necessarily an exaggeration. Sadly, I do encounter code like that. Um, I have encountered code like that uh, in the last two months. Um, and it's got is issues, right? I wouldn't, I've been doing LabVIEW for a long time, as a, many of you are in the room. I, I can't think how many of us would fancy, um, fancy our chances of debugging a problem in that code. Um, but yeah. Sorry for showing that, <laughs> but they can be more subtle stylistic issues, um, or as I like to call them, triggers for certain people. Um, these examples were supplied by two of my colleagues in the UK, uh, Matt Ferguson and Richard Thomas. Um, does anybody prefer the icon view for terminals? Rhetorical question. Um, but pet hates, ref and, and uh, this one actually has a couple of potential issues. References passed in and out of loops without the use of shift registers. Um, 
class terminal names not matching the actual class name, probably because somebody's used copy and paste at some point. Uh, front panel uh, layout not matching the connector pane. Um, long wires being run around the block diagram um, without any labels to indicate what they actually do, or maybe uh, similar data types, uh, similar data type wires being passed close to each other with any without any labeling to indicate which which wire is carrying what particular reference or data. So again, style issues. Performance issues, we're talking about things where we have an ability to affect the performance, the execution time, or perhaps the memory usage uh, with our application, with our program. So, for example, writing to the value property um, via a property node rather than use of a local variable. Um, here we've got an example where we've got um, an empty array. We had performing some repetitive task. And in this case, we're appending to the array um, and building an array which is growing on the shift register of that for loop. As we resize the array, as the array grows in size, LabVIEW has to make call, calls to the Windows Memory Manager to request more memory, which is inefficient. Uh, in this example here, we've got some quite complex logic. We're all we're effectively doing is we're looking to create an array of odd numbers by using quotient and remainder and checking to see if the remainder is one or zero, and then prepending to an array which is growing in size, and then reversing the array uh, to get it in ascending order. All three of these code pieces of code are examples of code that can be written more efficiently. And I know Darren, I'm sure you're going to paste. Darren's got some presentations on um, efficient code and improving code. Um, so for example, writing to a local variable rather than a property node. Uh, in this case, initializing an array for a particular size and then replacing array subset to replace the element in that array rather than pending to an array and making calls to the memory, potentially making calls to the memory manager. In this case, this code can be replaced with much simpler code, whereby we use probably my favorite feature in LabVIEW, the conditional terminal, in order to decide if an element should be added to an array or not. In this case, looking to see if the remainder is one or zero to determine whether the value should be added to the array. So far more efficient and actually more readable and simple code as well. So these are examples of code that can be more performant. OK, so we've we've seen we've got style issues, code that could be better laid out, more descriptive, more informative. We've got performance issues, code that could be more performant. Now, you might say, well, I've got 64 gigs of RAM on my uh, on my development machine and I, I don't I don't care about that. But some of us are working on high throughput data logging applications or perhaps working on resource constrained targets such as Rio targets where we do have to be mindful of the resources that we use, the memory that we use or the speed at which an, an application executes. So performance issues are extremely important. And then we've got something called dangerous constructs. Each of these are a piece of code which under certain circumstances might give us unwanted behavior. So for example, current VI's path. I see this an awful lot in companies where they have the full development environment in, on, on a lot of their test machines. And then if they need to deploy an executable and the LabVIEW runtime, they build their code and then at some point, somewhere, they get an error seven file not found because a path was incorrect. That's because current VI's path, its behavior can change. Uh, it behaves, it might behave differently in a built application. So see that one quite a lot. So actually being aware that we're using that construct would be an added benefit. Uh, file dialog, um, for example, file dialog, uh, pops up a really nice uh, dialog box uh, for a um, to a user to allow them to select uh, a file uh, or folder path. 
And if the user cancels that, um, it returns an error, but it also returns a Boolean output. And I often see confusion with users over which of those two outputs to use. Um, I think it's error 43 um, that's returned on the error cluster, and it also returns a Boolean true if the user cancelled that. Our write delimited spreadsheet has a pop-up embedded within it if a path is not provided. Uh, so if you are doing something in a loop within your application and you're calling write delimited spreadsheet VI and you're not the, for whatever reason, the path isn't being provided into that VI, then you're going to have a lot of annoying pop ups um, upsetting your end users. Um, launch nested actor inside pre launch in it. Um, that one's there just because um, that was an example of a problem that took a lot longer to identify than it should have. Um, and something that I've been extremely mindful of when working with customers who are using Actor Framework uh, and have systems that hang uh, is checking straight away, what are they doing in pre-launch in it? Um, a lot of you guys are developing database solutions for storing, uh, storing test data. And I see a lot of naked SQL syntax in LabVIEW code, uh, where the inputs into that. Uh, so for example, here we've got a, a select test program from where serial number equals and serial number is provi being provided um, as an input into the format into string. Um, but I see a lot of unsanitized uh, inputs into SQL statements. So for example, not checking that the string is empty uh, risks passing an empty string into that SQL command, which will produce errors. So unsanitized inputs into SQL statements, again, it's something that if you provide an input, it's going to work just fine. But in that rare circumstance where for whatever reason the input is empty, then we're going to get some errors that we might not have expected or we might not be handling correctly. Um, Use default if unwired terminal. Uh, use default if unwired option on case structure terminals, uh, output terminals. Um, can be very tempting, especially if you've got lots of cases in the case structure, um, especially around instrument control where you're building strings to specify instrument configurations. I see often uh, default values causing downstream errors. Um, I highlight that because they can be particularly hard to debug because it might not be immediately obvious what the source of the error is because typically it's downstream code that has been affected or downstream code that will throw the error, obviously, rather than the case structure. So it might be harder to find and debug. Um, references, empty references, or a reference has been passed into structures, into loops, without the use of shift register in that particular example that code will work fine provided that the array size is non-zero if the array size is zero then we're going to get an empty refnum on the right hand output border of that for loop so again the code works fine until the situation where we have a, a, a an array of size zero, in which case we will lose the reference. So again, it's likely to be downstream code that will actually um, manifest that particular problem. And then finally, if, for those of you, I know a few people have mentioned the use of DQMH, um, the use of the start module uh, without um, waiting for a module uh, waiting for the module's events to synchronize. Uh, so that risks sending uh, events or waiting for broadcasts from my DQMH module that, that before the module is ready to receive those events or be able to broadcast events back out to you. So in this case, the DQMH module might not be ready to receive that event and might not broadcast information back that we're expecting. So again, a dangerous construct, depending on what we're doing between starting the module and making the first request upon that module. So that could be a time dependent thing unless we explicitly call wait for module to synchronize events.
So we've got some dangerous constructs. So this sounds amazing, right? We've got a we've got a VI analyzer tool that can check block diagrams, it can check front panels, it can check VI properties, and we've highlighted that style's important because we want to make sure that uh, our block diagrams are readable and not a, a horrible cluttered mess, and that terminals match class names and all of those triggers that my colleagues have, and that we are not building arrays in an inefficient manner and that we don't have these latent defects lurking away in our code that are suddenly going to bite us when we try to build an executable or when we move to a faster machine perhaps so we've got a tool that can do that that sounds amazing so why isn't everybody using it and if we're in a room full of people i can see the camera from chamberlain put your hand up if you are using vi analyzer I'm hoping the camera feed is just locked up because I'm not seeing many hands go up. So why don't developers use it? Well, I asked this question when I first gave this presentation at an NI Week event, and these were genuine answers. I actually wrote these down because I, I couldn't believe some of them. I got uh, the answers were, I do acceptance testing. I don't need to test my code as I write it. I do acceptance testing. I test it when I have finished and I'm about to deliver to the customer. Customers don't pay for style. It fails for things I don't care about. It's disruptive to the way I work. There are so many results. I think that's a pretty bad sign. If there are so many results, you need to be looking at that. Or I did run it once, everything failed, so they never run it again. Or I can never remember where to find it. So effectively, we're talking about noise, false positives, and workflow. So what can we do about those three things to help us and to make adoption of the tool more widespread? Well, fortunately, VI Analyzer has a feature called configuration, VI Analyzer configurations. Effectively, a file that we can create to select what should be analyzed and how it should be analyzed. So effectively, which files do we want to analyze and how? which tests we are going to perform on those files. So we can create different CFGs for different scenarios. So for example, if we're producing demo code, we can create a CFG that perhaps looks at the front panels or the, 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 um, the block diagram layout for readability because it's demo code. We're trying to explain how something works in our demo code. So the block diagram should be clear, easy to understand, not overly complex. Everyday checking of code. So there are certain things that I think that we should be checking all the time with our code. Um, things like non-default VI icon, for example. Um, I, I lose count of the number of customers that I go in to see, and they've got these large, highly parallel LabVIEW applications and hidden in there, two or three examples of the default VI icon. Uh, so checking of code for the very, what I, the, the basic things, right? Making sure that a VI isn't called untitled one.vi, for example. Pre-delivery inspection, we probably want to check for a lot more, maybe everything. So we could have a CFG that is appropriate for that particular scenario. High performance applications, we're going to be checking things like uh, how we're building arrays, yeah. um, the use of property nodes or the value property, checking to make sure that our, our application is as performant as is possible. And maybe we have a CFG for looking at things like cross-platform portability, making sure that we don't have any ActiveX code in there um, if we're going to be migrating our application to Mac or Linux, for example. So in this example, we're going to create and save a VI analyzer configuration. So here we've got the same two VIs. We're going to select analyze VIs, start a new task. In this case, I'm going to analyze the, the current project. 
we've got these two VIs, as I say, that have got block diagram issues. We're going to select which tests we actually want to run on them. Surprise, surprise, we're just going to set, select the tests that we know that fail just for expediency in this example. So we're going to select wire under object and the front panel non-transparent labels. And while that's running, great tip from Darren, never wire the output of the file dialog, just use the cancel output. Nice one. So we've selected the tests that we want to run and we've selected the VIs that we want to run those tests upon. So we're going to save our CFG this time. So we're going to give it a name and this was probably the NI week demo. So we're going to call it NI week and we're going to go ahead and save it. We can choose to password protect it if we like, and then we're going to analyze. And of course, we're going to get those failures because we know those VIs do have failures in there. And we can click on it and see what that failure was. Now we're going to go ahead and close VI Analyzer and reopen it. But this time we're going to select our CFG. So we're going to choose to open an existing VI Analyzer configuration. So load a previously saved configuration, going to browse to it, select it, and this time the VIs to be analyzed and the tests to perform on those VIs have been pre-selected. So we can now arm ourselves with a <coughs> collection of VI analyzer configurations to be used in different scenarios, such as the scenarios I mentioned earlier, checking for performance code, maybe pre-delivery inspection, maybe everyday checking of basic items where we want the analysis to be a little bit more rapid than perhaps a pre-delivery where we're going to do a thorough analysis that might take tens of minutes to perform on a large code base. So we've got C CFG. So what should you check? Okay, what, what sorts of things should we be checking? Well, that's that's up to you really. We've talked about, you know, current VI's path, for example. We've talked about non-transparent non labels. Um, hey Chris, we have, maybe, we, have a quick, we have a quick question. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the config files, are the config files tied to the project? Can you create a common config to be used across multiple projects? We are going to talk about that with using different configs to be used via the API. So we're going to talk a little bit about the VI Analyzer API. I believe when using from VI Analyzer from the actual uh, dialog, from the VI Analyzer tool that we've just seen, I believe that the config is tied to the contents being analyzed and the tests being performed. Correct me if I'm wrong, Darren. Yeah, there's there's not any sort of connection between a config file and anything else. You you can have one that defines only tests and no files. You can have one that defines uh, no tests and only files, and everything that's stored in it is path based. And so you can have a single config that maybe just has tests selected and nothing else, and use that as a template that you then import into all, or that you then include with all your projects, and then add the files from that project from and go from there. Thank you. So the main thing is you can define your own rules for what are important to you, such as VI properties, file names, options like separating source code from compiled code, uh, front panel things like the non-transparent labels. The main thing is you, know, you and your development team can align on what these rules are, what is important to you as a development team for those different scenarios that we've just talked about. But of course, you know, you might have things. We, we, you know, VI analyzer. I think Varen said it ships with ninety-two or ninety-six tests. There's a lot of tests that cover an awful lot of important things that we should care about in our lab view code. But of course, there might be something specific to you as a developer or your organization that's important. So, in those circumstances, VI analyzer actually comes with a. Re a really useful tool called the test creator to provide um, a, a template so that we can create our own tests. So you can build your own tests to test for the things that you care about in your lab you code. 
within that template, which is effectively um, a, a, an LLB, um, we can use VI server methods and properties to actually analyze the code under test. So we're going to write LabVIEW code to analyze our own LabVIEW code to make sure it complies with the rules. Um, we can then put those tests in LabVIEW project, VI analyzer tests, you can create your own directory structure under there, um, depending on what those tests are. Perhaps you might have some sort of hierarchy, but we can create our own tests, put them into a location in LabVIEW and have them be available to us with the VI Analyzer. So here we're talking about rolling our own. So this is a kind of a bit of a contrived example of what some code might look like. But here I'm caring about having duplicate array indicators on the front panel of a VI, but not exposing them in the connector pane. So they're kind of, this is a sub VI, and those array indicators are kind of redundant, right? They're not being passed out via the con pane, and they are duplicates. They are wired to the same source. So why have them, why have them there at all? So we can write some LabVIEW code to say, okay, is this, uh, term, is this an indicator? This array, is it an indicator? Is it on the connector pane? Um, if it isn't, then we can fail the test to alert us to the fact that we've got an array indicator that isn't being passed to the connector pane. So why, why is it there on my sub VI? Um, that's just one example. Um, we've, al we've already seen the tra non-transparent label is a uh, control label is built in to VI analyzer, but if we wanted to write our own to do the same thing, it might look something like that, where we check, we access the block diagram reference using VI server, we obtain a reference to the, sorry, we obtain a reference to the panel, we get all of the controls that are on the panel, and then for each one, we check the label background color to see if it's non-transparent. So uh, if we get a little bit of time, after the break, we can have a look at building one of these ourselves as an example. Um, we'll see how the time goes. The other thing I want to point out is VI Analyzer Enthusiast Group, which Darren posted a link to and which is um, also linked at the end of this presentation. There are an awful lot of community developed, by Darren, but there are a whole lot of community developed VI Analyzer tests that tests for some really cool things, um, such as uh, an example might be in range and coerce, where the lower limit is greater than the upper limit, things like that, where that can be pretty tricky to debug and find. Um, so somebody, Darren probably, wrote a VI analyzer test to test for that. Uh, so uh, Check out VI Analyzer Enthusiast Group. There's a whole bunch of VI Analyzer tests, custom VI Analyzer tests that you can add to your LabVIEW in, uh, installation to be able to test for those things. So, and everybody loves free stuff, right? So anything that you can do with VI scripting can be incorporated into a VI Analyzer test. So it allows us to reference block diagram objects and to test that block diagram for its compliance to certain things, the rules that we've defined um, that we want our code to comply with. But it also allows for the creation, removal, and changing of items on the block diagram. So in this particular example, and again, this is a contrived example just to show what we could do. But in this particular example, we've got our duplicate array indicator of which one of them is not wired to the connector pane. And I wanted to draw attention to this. So we've actually written some code within the VI analyzer test to add a block diagram comment to the VI analyzer, to the VI that has been analyzed and subsequently failed, and to also put a diagram disable structure around the offending code, to put it around the terminal that is not connected to the connector pane. So we can actually modify our failing code with a comment or perhaps an extra piece of code to draw attention to the problem that has been identified by the VI analyzer test. So we can test for things, we can create our own tests, and our own tests can be responsible for adding comments <coughs> to failing code or making modifications. Obviously, I know in certain 
controlled or regulated industries, automatically modifying code is a big no-no, but it's just to kind of give you a flavor of what is possible. I'll come back to the live demo a little bit later because we've got an awful lot still to cover. So there's also an API. So VI Analyzer comes with a couple of palettes. There's a easy palette for quickly running an existing CFG. And then there's a lower level palette for customizing the analysis task, such as adding items to the task, items being VIs, um, and removing items from a task. So an example where we might build um, using the API, here we, we start a VI analyzer task. We open an existing CFG uh, that has a number of tests or files defined. In this case, I'm removing the existing VI list from that CFG and then adding target VIs to the CFG to then be analyzed. So I've got a CFG that's already defined that I've used on a project. It tests a number of VIs by using a number of tests. A number of tests have been defined. And here we're programmatically adding items to that task, adding VIs to be tested. And then we're calling the run function, the run VI, to perform that analysis and to give us the results programmatically. So we can now start to use VI Analyzer programmatically in our tool chain to analyze code. So an example might be, we might want to check the code every time we make a commit to source code control. So every time I commit my piece of code in Git, I might want to do some basic checks on it. Um, that guy, Joel, when, uh, from, the, uh, from the book in slide four or five, makes a comment that says, in general, the longer you wait to fix, sorry, the longer you wait before fixing a bug, the costlier in time and money it is to fix. And he also made a comment, bad code that gets committed tends to stay committed. Okay, So if we can make sure that some basic tests have been performed on code before we commit, then we're off to a good start. So in this example, we can use, a pr uh, I'm using Git in this example, but we could, every time we make a commit, we could get a list of the changed files, the VIs that have been changed as part of this commit. And on those VIs that have changed, we could run some basic VI analyzer tests using the API that we've just seen, and then decide whether the code should be committed or not. Now, obviously, we want our commit and our workflow to be nice and smooth. So the types of tests, we're not going to be running a huge list of tests, but we might be running some basic tests, like make sure the VI isn't called untitled1.vi, that it doesn't have the default icon, uh, for example. Maybe we don't want to allow broken code to be committed. Who knows? But we could perhaps perform some basic checks every time we make a commit. So we can we can use that VI analyzer to perform those tests. In this case, I'm using a pre-commit hook with Git. So when I commit my code using Git, I get a list of all the changed files and I run VI analyzer on those changed files. So let's see what that might look like in action. So this is my Git client. And right now I've got no changes. My working copy is clean. There's nothing to commit. I'm now going to open my project and I'm going to make a change to one of my VIs. So cosmetic change, I've just moved something. I'm going to go back to my Git client and I'm going to now, we should see in a second, yep, there's a VI that's changed. There's now a change that can be committed. So I'm going to commit it. I'm going to add a commit note. Hit the commit button. And that has now triggered the running of my VI analyzer tests. And in this case, guess what? It's going to fail. So the VI analyzer test has failed. As we saw there, I'd actually also added a comment to the failed block diagram and Diagram disabled the code 
that was actually failing the test. So I've made a change to the code and added a block diagram comment to say that the code has been automatically modified. So I'm going to resume. I'm going to try and commit again. Add my commit note because the code's been changed again automatically. So the code has been updated by VI Analyzer. Hit commit. And now, because the code has been modified, it should pass the VI Analyzer test and allow it to be committed to my source code control repository. So there's a couple of things happening here. What we're doing is we are triggering, based on some action, the running of the VI Analyzer API in order to test code before it's committed to our source code control repository. In this case, I'm using a Git hook, but there's numerous ways that that could be triggered. The main thing is that we're using the API of VI Analyzer to programmatically analyze the code. So in this case, we've got a little helper application that can be used to do certain things. One of the tasks is to run VI Analyzer tests. Another tool um, that uses the API. Yes, sorry. What was that? Uh, what was that uh, user interface you're using for uh, your repository? What's that app? Uh, this uh, this is actually it's called Tower Tower for Git. Okay, I've made a note. I will. Yeah, Tower for Git is the Git client. But any Git, um, basically, even if you're using the Git command line, uh, you can use Git hooks to trigger actions when certain things happen, such as on commit. Uh, you can trigger actions to happen, such as running a batch file, or in my case, running a VI on on sorry run yes running a vi that uses the vi analyzer api to analyze those vi's that are being committed yep yeah no someone so, asked in the chat what uh, what your yeah this is tap this is tap tower for git uh, there's a windows and a mac version thank you okay so other use of vi analyzer api well we when we talked about the um, when we talked about why don't people use it, the first thing was was the noise or the false positives. So we've potentially addressed the noise, uh, testing things that I don't care about or testing things that aren't important to me at that point in time. We've potentially um, addressed that by using a CFG, by using a VI analyzer configuration to determine what tests should be performed on what VIs. So that helps us to reduce the amount of noise at a given point in time. One of the other items was workflow. So how can I integrate VI Analyzer into workflow? So here's an example where we might want to run VI Analyzer just on a VI or a couple of VIs um, as we're actually developing. So this is a tool that I developed uh, to allow uh, the running of VI Analyzer against VIs directly from the LabVIEW project. So you saw the link previously, you can go and grab that from the LabVIEW Tools Network. Um, and once installed, you can right click on a VI in the project window and select either a recent VI analyzer configuration to be used to analyze that VI or to pick a new VI analyzer configuration that you might have on disk to be, to be used to analyze that VI. And you can select one or more VIs directly from the project. So in this case, I'm going to select a new VI analyzer configuration to be used to analyze that VI. I picked one and it's going to analyze it, show me the result. And just while the project's open, we've got a little glyph on the project item to indicate whether the VI passed or failed the VI analyzer test and we can select one or more VIs to be analyzed. So in this case, we're gonna run the same, same CFG again, but on a different, on a, on a VI that should pass the test. And we can see it passed the test and we get a green glyph. So without leaving our project environment, we can quickly check the VIs in our project and run certain VI analyzer configs 
on those. And also, um, I can do a little demo of this later. Uh, Sam, Sam Taggart from uh, uh, SAS Workshops um, got in touch with me about a VI Analyzer quick drop shortcut that is created for running um, VI Analyzer configurations on VIs that are shown as modified in Git. And there's a link to his GitLab there. Um, by all means, check that out. Um, this is definitely this is work in progress. So Sam's not ready to submit this to the tools network yet, but invites you to go and take a look at it, check it out, see if you like it, uh, maybe make suggestions for the repo, contribute back into it. Uh, but this is a tool for running VI Analyzer configurations directly from the block diagram using a quick drop shortcut. I'll give a little demo of this in a second. So pretty neat tool as well. So let's let's have a look at that one actually. Let's have a look at both of those tools. So if I open my demo VIs, I've got a couple of VIs in my project. If I want to go ahead and run the VI Analyzer project provider that I talked about earlier, we can go down to we can right click, select VI Analyzer tools, analyze using new VI Analyzer configuration file. Browse for a configuration file. Now my VI is going to be analyzed as per that configuration. The results displayed and a glyph put on the item to show its status. And I can see see what failed in this case. That old our old friend, the non-transparent labels. And the other tool that I mentioned, uh, Sam's tool, can simply go to the block diagram. And then with a quick drop shortcut, control space, control Q, we can instantiate his tool. And the VM really doesn't like it while I'm on Teams at the same time. But with his tool, he shows a list of VIs that have currently got changes logged against them in Git. And we can choose to analyze those changed VIs using a specified VI analyzer configuration. So again, work in progress, but definitely something um, that's got some promise. So a couple of little, little tools help integrate VI Analyzer into your day-to-day -day workflow. Um, certainly not perfect, but definitely things that can facilitate the use of VI Analyzer in your day-to-day -day work. So what if I don't want to test a particular VI? So we've got, we, we talked about false positives, we talked about um, noise, so for example, what if I've got a rule that applies to all my code? Like I want to be careful about the number of wire bends, for example, but in one of my VIs, I've got an awful lot of property nodes. For, perhaps that VI is uh, dealing with the test and API, for example, where I've got a lot of property nodes and I've got a lot of wire bends through necessity because I've got a lot of references being passed around, being turned into child reference or being cast into child or parent references. And my, my block diagrams just naturally got a lot of bends in it because of the, the structure of the code. So I don't want to apply that rule to that particular VO. Is there anything I can do? Well, turns out there is. I can add a bookmark, so a free label with a hashtag at the beginning of it, I can add a bookmark to the block diagram to ignore to ignore to ignore all failures of that test for that particular block diagram. So I can add the bookmark followed by the test name. Um, so we saw the test names in the VI Analyzer dialog. They all have names. That's the name that we add to this bookmark in order to ignore that particular test 
for this particular block diagram. So for example, wires under objects, if I add the bookmark, VIA, ignore, wires under objects, if I add that to the block diagram of that particular VI, then that test will be ignored of that particular VI. So that's pretty useful. But what happens if I've got, uh, uh, maybe I'm dealing with a higher level VI and there's one part of the code or one object on the block diagram that I want to ignore, but I, I want to apply the rule to the remainder of the block diagram. Well, we can put the same bookmark on the block diagram, but we can attach it to a specific object that we want to ignore in terms of test failure for that particular test. So in this case, I want to ignore wires under objects for that particular wire, but any other wires that we have on the block diagram that pass under objects will be considered and checked against for that particular test and can generate test failures if they do pass under objects. So we can choose to ignore specific tests for objects or for the entire block diagram. And Darren's just pointed out the ignore feature works in 2018 and later, which is useful to know. Yep. So, in summary, reviewing code early increases quality. VI Analyzer can be your code reviewer. You don't need to sit with a colleague and have some awkward session. VI Analyzer can be your code reviewer. And as we've seen, VI Analyzer can be integrated into your workflow so we can reduce the noise from tests that we potentially don't care about. We can reduce the noise by testing for particular scenarios. Depending on what we're trying to achieve, we can run different CFGs. VI Analyzer can be integrated into your workflow by calling it either via the VI Analyzer tool or perhaps via the project private provider or perhaps via Thams tool and um, go check those two out. It can modify your code such as adding a comment just to say what the analysis uh, failed for or putting a structure around the offending item to draw your attention to it. And you can use it to define your team's style and enforce that style. So get together as a team and define how, what does our lab view code look like? Write a style guide or a coding standard or whatever you want to call it. Go ahead and write something like that as a team. Make sure that you all agree with it and then enforce that standard by running VI Analyzer. Um, before you ship code for demos, run VI Analyzer. Make sure your code um, is representing your, your company correctly. Um, if it's a demo code, it should have a nicely laid out block diagram. It should have VI documentation, et cetera. Further reading, the VI Analyzer Enthusiast Community Group. There's a good presentation there by Darren. Um, and so many VI Analyzer tests that you can add to your own LabVIEW installation to really help you improve your code quality. Uh, One more thing. So a lot of people that introduced themselves at the beginning of this session, and I know this is a lab user group, but a lot of people mentioned test and. And test and, as I mentioned at the beginning, also has a tool. Test and has a tool called sequence analyzer that can be used to find errors, enforce guidelines. It can also be used to, and it doesn't list it explicitly there, look for dangerous constructs. Seems a little bit familiar. It's a static code analysis tool. It runs on idle code. It's available via the sequence editor or can stand alone. I'm just going to dive into this really quickly just to show what do I mean by test stand dangerous constructs? Well, here's an example. In test stand, you can force the outcome of a step, such as force a step to pass or fail. That can be really useful when debugging. For example, maybe when a test fails, you drop into some diagnostic routine. So it can be really useful to be able to force the outcome of a test. 
it can also be extremely dangerous to not be aware that a test is forced to pass or fail when that sequence makes it out onto the production floor. And I have actually seen customers have tests set to force pass that they weren't aware of, and they were sat there joyfully, joyfully aware that their yield was at about 90 95% overall, um, and actually most of the tests were actually being forced to pass. So that's a dangerous construct, something that we can use Sequence Analyzer to actually test for. So that's our scenario-based testing. That particular test, that dangerous construct, is only a problem when it comes to deployment. During debug, it might be totally fine to force the outcome of a test. Where do I find it? It's available as a standalone tool. So from the Windows Start menu, we can find Sequence Analyzer, or it's available in the test stand environment via the toolbar. So we've got two static code analysis tools. Um, I'm not going to dwell too much on this because I'm aware this is a LabVIEW user group, and this presentation will be made available to you um, afterwards anyway, along with the uh, the, the the demo code that I showed quickly, just to point out that if you do use test stand and you want to build your own sequence analyzer tests, you build those tests using LabVIEW code. So we can write LabVIEW code much in the same way that we built our own VI analyzer tests. We can build sequence analyzer tests to traverse our test stand sequences to look at the properties of our test stand sequence and to assess it based on some rules that we define. Of course, NI do provide a number of inbuilt tests, things like is a test, is a test set to port, force pass or force fail, but we can define our own tests, things that are important to us as a development team, and then we can deploy those. So there's instructions on where you can get the template for defining a new test stand sequence analyzer test that information's in here uh, take a copy of that template um, and absolutely use the template as a starting point uh, because not doing so requires expert test and knowledge and there's a lot of helpful comments telling you exactly where you need to add code in order to implement your vi uh, your sequence analyzer test so absolutely no excuse right for having great quality lab view and test and code okay that's it uh, from me um, any questions i'm going to leave my email address if anybody's got any specific uh, jeff we will cir uh, circulate the slides and that demo code as well um, and obviously the links to sam's tool and the project provider tool are in there as well uh, but let's open it up for any any questions that anyone might have. I have a question for either. It's either going to be for you, Chris, or maybe Darren will have to answer this one. Maybe. Go I know Darren's it. not going to. Darren's not going to like the question, probably. Um, <laughs> how does a VI analyzer handle VIs that are in a pack library? Does it ignore them, I assume? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, every VI analyzer test uh, does a check to see if it is able to analyze the VI you're pointing it at. So if you yep. if if you have built a PPL and you have set the default options on that PPL, which means diagrams are going to be removed from VIs, and you point all of the VI analyzer tests that ship with the toolkit to that VI. It will analyze the VI, um, but only tests that can look at the front panel are going to do anything. All the rest of the tests are just going to skip. They're not going to do anything because there's not a diagram to look at. So to answer your question, yes, you can analyze VIs in a PPL, but it would be of uh, limited benefit because most of the time you're interested in diagram things, and most of the time you build a PPL with VIs with no diagrams. Yep, and I was just looking at it from the, like, I guess the perspective of if I'm going to do everything in a project, there might be a couple of PPLs. So at least it doesn't uh, throw a fit and say, well, I can't do this because of that. So that's good. 
Awesome. Yeah, it should it shouldn't ever throw a fit. Cool. What are some favorite uh, add-on tests that you've come across? You mentioned that there's quite a bit on the enthusiast. Yeah, absolutely. So the the swapped inputs on comparison functions is probably uh, probably my favorite. There's also a, a good one for looking at uh, cluster constants um, to uh, help the block diagram space. If you've got a cluster such as uh, this one, um, obviously it takes quite a lot of block diagram space. Um, if the values are default values in the cluster, uh, the VI analyzer checks to see have you show, sorry have you shown it as displayed it as an icon rather than as an expanded cluster because obviously it conserves a lot more um, block diagram space. Uh, but it checks first to make sure that the values within the cluster are the default values of that um, of, of that. That's pretty neat. Uh, what's your favorite one, Darren? I mean, I think the I just, the swapped co the swapped inputs on the comparisons probably probably saved um, probably into a good number of hours that it saved me debugging because it it's a tricky one to find, right? I just put in the chat. Um, my my opinion, which is when you go to the list of community tests on the website, several of the tests have names that start with the word find. And I have found many of those incredibly valuable for when I need to search my entire code base for something like a, the use of a particular function or the use of a particular property or method from VI server. And the built-in lab you find uh, can sometimes be lacking, like it, it requires everything to be in memory, for example, whereas the VI analyzer test doesn't require things to be in memory. So all of those find tests that are listed there, I, I find those to be quite valuable uh, a lot of the time. So I swapped, uh, the question was asked, swapped out, I should have explained that better. So if you've got the in range and coerce function, Let's put up the context help as well, and you've got a uh, you've got a lower limit that's greater than the upper limit. For example, that's a pretty tricky one. Cool, thank you. Yeah, those are good uh, good suggestions. I don't miss any other questions. Yeah, don't ever write project providers. Is it that bad? Is it? I like it, but Darren thinks I'm insane. So it it yeah. You're uh, you're playing with fire. You're playing with fire, Chris. So what did you do then? Did you just have some sort of property node straight into the side of the project, or was it something a bit more? Maybe, maybe that's magic, maybe that's something for maybe, yeah. Maybe that's something for a uh, for a for another user group. That's for a beer someone, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is. uh, does VI Analyzer do any tests that are specific to DQMH? Um, so I know that um, internally um, we have um, internally fallen foul of the not waiting for uh, module events to synchronize, or some developers have fallen foul of the not waiting for module events to synchronize, and potentially um, asking for something to happen or waiting for, to be notified that something happened in a module before the module is ready. Um, so we have the analyzer test to check for that. And as Darren said, I'm sure the, uh, the DKMH consortium folks have some. I guess it would be nice to ignore some of the some of the DQMH uh, created VIs, some of the scripting created code um, would be nice to ignore some of those with the VI analyzer tests. Yeah, but I, uh, to answer the question from earlier, as Darren pointed out too, you're doing a lot of the DQMH stuff can be found running the validate module or the validate tools for that module or your whole project. So I think even if you did that and then you combined it with uh, VI analyzer that might you may set up that'll just select all the um, VIs that you've created to add to your 
structure, that would be a good way to go because then you can do your 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 general or generic or standard DQMH test on everything that's DQMH driven, but then you have the VI analyzer to do everything that you've added to it. Yeah, that would probably work out really well. Any other questions? It's so quiet. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I should have pointed out, and I did a terrible job. Um, and I, I, like I said, I was aware this is the LabVIEW user group, but the slides are in there for the C, uh, for the test time guys. Um, but there's an API uh, also for the um, so the the, the test time sequence analyzer uh, can be called programmatically and can have arguments passed to it. So you can in integrate that into your CI workflow as well, right? So you make a change to the sequence and automatically trigger the running of the sequence analyzer tests, just like we did with the example with the uh, with the lab view code. Did you hear that? I did not. No, could you repeat? Oh, he, he said it was such a good presentation and answered <laughs> all of our questions. Oh, too kind. Yeah. Well, we'll get the we'll get the slides to everybody as well, so you can start having a play um, with the. So I mentioned the VI analyzer tool. So you can simply go to VI Analyzer, create new test, and there's a little wizard that kind of guides you through um, the creation of a test. So let's just go and create one, put it into a location, and as I mentioned, you know, the folks at NI have kindly put in comments here to basically guide you through the process and tell you that you know you need to go and put in code they've already kindly put in code to obtain a reference to the block diagram uh, there's a couple of vi's in here that can tell you whether the vi that you're testing has a block diagram um, has a panel so you can they, they've given you a really good starting point to then use vi server properties and methods to be able to traverse that block diagram or the objects on that block diagram and analyze it to determine does this VI comply with the test that I'm that I'm in the process of creating? But really good use, uh, really good starting point. But take a look, as I mentioned, you know, I don't want to go into into a specific test here, but take a look at the enthusiast group. Uh, there's a lot of example tests there that you can use as a starting point if they don't quite satisfy what it is that you're trying to achieve. Uh, there's Darren's presentation up there as well. Yeah, you should be able to speak up. There's microphones in the room, so you just have to speak up a little bit. In one of the early examples, we talked about this VI, the VI reference, being a, a red flag for VI analyzer. But oh, yeah, current, current VI's path. Current VI's path, yeah. So what do you do when you have one of those? And be aware of the fact that it can change. What, what are the solutions for? Where was it? It's this yeah. guy, isn't it? Yeah. So the so on that particular so the, there are a couple of other alternatives that are available. Uh, so let's let's put a block diagram up for a second. So as I mentioned, current VI's path. Uh, have a look at uh, sorry, blah, 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 file constants. So, quick drop. drop would have been faster. I know it would, but I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, there's a couple of other options here. Um, application directory. Um, so, where that where my uh, project is, or where my built executable is. We have a look. At, let's pull context. Sorry, I've got the Teams window blocking everything that I'm actually trying to look at. I love Teams. Yes, I know it would have been faster. Brilliant. Brilliant. Move this across to the side here so we can actually all see what it says about. Returns the path to the directory containing the application. So that'll be different in the application version. 
Sorry, I didn't. I I didn't get that. So that will be different for the built application as opposed to working in after the environment. Well, so the the issue with current VI's path is that when you build the VI, sorry, when you build the executable, the VI now is inside of an executable, so its path has actually changed. Application directory returns the path to the directory containing the application. So if you move the application on disk, it's going to return. So the, typically where you see use cases that fail are when people are trying to reference a config file or something that sits adjacent to the vi and then they build it into an executable and the path to that vi is now changed so if you use application directory as an example then if you move the the the, the path that's returned is the application or the project i want to say if it's in an unbuilt state also when people are looking for specific or building paths using current vi path so they're building paths to config files or building paths to um, locations where results are going to be stored again if you move the executable, that's going to change. In that case, I would recommend using something like get system directory where you've got specific directories that are identified, such as application data, public documents, uh, user documents. If it's user specific preferences, for example, then I would suggest using the get system directory function because that's going to remain constant even if your VI is then built into an executable or indeed if the executable moves on disk, the path to public documents will always remain the same. The, using the VI reference, I usually use it when I'm trying to find, we're trying to call another VI that's going to be by, by calling it by reference, building a path to that VI. And that can change depending on whether you're in the IDE or built application. Yeah. Yep. And it, Darren is putting in little suggestions for how to deal with it. Yep. So. There's there's a lot. There's a few different ways. I mean, just by well, what's in the chat? There's, you know, using the app directory, you've got, like it says in the chat, if you're running in code in IDE, it's it's going to point to a lab project directory. If you're running executable, it's going to point to executable folder. Right. Um, you know, like Darren said, his his preferred option is stick everything in your in a folder, like on a C drive, right? For me here, I build everything into. Well, I have everything. All my code is in one drive because we use one drive, so I have a backup copy of it there as well as in my repository. So for me, it's a little harder to do that. Yeah. I've done a couple things where I'll either use like what Josh suggested, use a conditional diagram, uh, depending what I'm doing. Uh, I use a lot of INI files, so. You know, I built the code so it looks for a specific INI file when I'm doing my code development, but then when it goes to run an executable, it finds a completely different INI and I don't have to change a thing. So we also do and some, I, something like what Darren just mentioned too, where we have a folder that we know exists on every computer in the company. And so we can store a lot of things in that folder so that no matter what, you know that that folder will exist on every computer we have. But I'm distributing to you know, hundreds of users who have sure. all different. But you can also use your project. Your installer can create the folder yeah. when it does install it. So you can make sure that that folder will exist on whatever you install that program on. Yep. However, however, Darren's suggestion would fail my platform portability VI analyzer test because yeah. Linux, Mac, whereas, whereas the system directory and we'll return the public documents folder if we're running on Mac OS, then it'll return the user folder. What if we're running on Windows, could... it'll return the OS approved location for preferences, for example. Chris, what about if you actually did similar to what Darren said, which is actually you you basically build your your executable or build your application in a single directory. And so long as everything is contained in that directory, you could actually use that as a relative path. So your application path reference would actually be as good as 
what you're saying there with the get system directory. But I'm guessing with your relative path, are you going to be using something like build path? What's your base path? What's your starting point? No, sorry, your base your base path is your application reference. If you go back into that palette, the one you were looking at a minute ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, 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 um, blah, blah, blah. So regardless of whether you're in the project or whether you're in yeah. the actual executable, so long as everything is held within that location, it makes it 100% portable and also makes it totally reworkable with the LabVIEW project. Okay. Yeah. Mm. I mean, there's a lot. I, I like Darren's suggestion as well. Mm. <laughs> uh, it comes down to building it into the installer, which is the next stepping stone, isn't it? Chris, it was fantastic to have you as a presenter today. I want to thank you very much for okay. taking the time of your day to join us. No, my pleasure. My pleasure. Does that mean I can have a beer like uh, Mr. Glass did at the beginning? <laughs> <laughs> that beer is at the spot, mate, I'll tell you. <laughs> did you need it to get through one of my presentations? I remember the events when you did in London, mate. That took me a good hour to get over with. Thank you very much, Jeff. My pleasure yeah, to join no, you guys today. Really, and, and and I have to say, super, super impressed by the turnout, the the, um, the number of people you've got supporting this event. This is really great to see. Yes, um, we used to, like I said, it used to be twenty some in person, and we'd have a good time, and now it's down to what six or seven of us in person, and everybody online. So I'm hoping and still having future. a, hopefully still having a good time. Yes. I'm hoping at a future, like I said, at a future meeting here, for those of us that are local, we'll actually have food, which will motivate more people to come. I know there's a few that that are food motivated to come anyway. Um, I did want to also mention, before I forget, that for those of you that are interested in GDEFCON, as, as Chris mentioned, uh, GDEFCON is uh, happening in Europe in September, but it's happening here in uh, for the NA, GWCon NA is happening again in July. It is, I'm going to look at my calendar so I don't get the dates completely wrong. It is the week of July 17th. So GWCon NA will actually be the 18th, 19th, and 20th. So it's a Tuesday through Thursday. Uh, and also on the 17th, it will be, uh, there will be a, TH, a DSH a workshop. So I hope to see uh, many of you there. I'm planning on being there myself. It's going to be again. It'll be back in Golden, Colorado, just like it was last year. Same same location. Uh, tickets are on sale, and I believe there is a call for presenters. So if you guys are, if anybody's interested in presenting, please uh, go to the website, fill out a form with uh, all the information required to uh, for us to review your uh, presentations. And with that, um, I think that's it for our meeting today. If anybody else had any questions about anything, feel free to speak up on the online or in the room. We'll be around for a little bit yet. Yeah.